don't think we'll quite make it, but we'll get um, quite a quite a ways on. Um, I want to pick up with page ninety six, where we left off on what day was it? Friday. On Friday, um, was Taryn deciding at the end of chapter ten that he was going to go on to care Dathel so that he could tell. Um, the High King and others, what has happened to Gwydion, that he's seen the Horned King, etc., etc., and Fluter and um, Ailanwi agree to go with him along with Gurgi. So in 96, uh, page 96 in chapter 11, they're making their way through the hills because Fluter has told um, Terran how to get to Caradathel. They're making their way through, and let's see this. Taryn is marching last in the line. He's holding Melinger's bridle, that is uh, Gwydion's horse, and we're told at the top of that page, page 96, in Cair Dalbin, he had dreamed of being a hero, but dreaming he had come to learn was easy. And at Cair Dalbin, no lives depended on his judgment. He longed for Gwydion's strength and guidance. His own strength, he feared, was not equal to his task. Now, if you remember back in Cair Dalbin, you know, Dalbin has some things to say about being a hero, and he and Call both have some things to say about uh, achieving goals, let's say. Such as, how do you, you know, Taryn wants to make a sword. How does call begin? With horseshoes. Why? Because you have to learn how to mold the metal, so to speak. In other words, Taryn wants to, you know, if Taryn were an artist, if, if Taryn wanted to be a, a Michelangelo, Rembrandt, something like that, where does Taryn think he should be able to start? With the Mona Lisa. But, what did, you know, use Da Vinci, Mona Lisa. Where did Da Vinci have to begin? Probably like this. As, I don't know, a two year old? A three year old? He didn't immediately set out, boom, and paint the Mona Lisa. Okay? Uh, Michelangelo didn't immediately walk into the Sistine Chapel with a bunch of cans of paint and go, oh, and boom, it magically appeared. He had to start with the little baby steps, then move on to the bigger steps. Taryn dreamed what? Oh, the glory of being a hero. Never thinking takes a lot of hard work. And now that he is, even though he is unaware of it, now that he is being heroic, what's he now aware of? It's a lot of hard work. And moreover, people's lives depend on me. That's why he thinks he longed for Gwydion's strength and judgment. Why? A lot easier to have somebody else making those all-important decisions. A lot easier to rely on somebody else's strength. Because bear in mind again. How old is Taryn? 10, 11, 12, 13 maybe. I think that's pushing it, but okay. So he turns as they keep walking. He turns and he looks back. He looks back on in the direction of Spiral Castle and Gwydion's burial mound. Thinking, well, doesn't do any good to wish I had Gwydion's strength. Why? Because Gwydion's strength and what else? His guidance? That took a while to develop, even in Gwydion's part. Okay? So, they go on. They notice there's horsemen behind them, etc. They realize they can't rest. They keep going. Chapter 12, I'm, I'm going to skip a lot. We have the wolves and such. Page 107. Karen says, 
At first, right in the middle of the page, I thought I would be able to reach Cairdathel by myself. That is, when he initially decided I've got to go tell Math, the king, about what's happened, I thought I could do it by myself. I see now I wouldn't have even got this far without help. Well, how wouldn't he have gotten this far? Well, he didn't know the directions. He couldn't Google or MapQuest it. He had to flute or flam it. Okay? Flute or flam helped him. It is a good destiny that brings me such brave companions. Now, remember, it was Gwydion who said, It seems that it is my destiny to have a pig keeper assist me on my quest. Hmm. Or is it the other way around? Is it my destiny to help him on his quest? Well, Terran's using destiny also. But how does what does he mean by it? This is fate. This is just how it's kind of supposed to be. Alonwi, you've done it again. It's all you care about. Someone to, how does, how does Ilanwi take Terran's words? Terran notices, says, I wouldn't have gotten this far without help. Is Terran emphasizing himself? Or is he emphasizing the help that he's received? Because Ilanwi says, that's all you care about. Someone to help you carry spears and swords and what all. It could be anybody, and you'd be just as pleased. In other words, Ilanwi takes Taryn's words, and she's kind of emphasizing, oh, you're only thinking about yourself here. Who helps you carry the stuff doesn't matter to you. Taryn replies, more to himself, notice, than to Ilanwi. Nothing At home, nothing ever happens. And because nothing ever happened, what did Terran dream about? Being a hero. He dreamt about something glorious happening. About really anything happening. But somehow, excuse me, now everything happens. But somehow I can never seem to make it come out right. That is, now something happens every day. And what's the something that seems Terran's mindset? to happen. Because? Because he keeps screwing up. Yeah. So, he bows uh, with a sigh, he held his, his bow ready, and began his turn at guard. Th this is not the mindset you want your lone sentinel to have at night. You know, crap's happening and it's all my fault. Because that doesn't put him in a proper frame of, frame of mind to stay awake, to defend everybody, etc., etc. Okay? Skip a bunch again. They make their way and they discover the Hidden Valley. Chapter 13. Okay? And we meet a guy named Medwin or Meduin. Depends on how you want to pronounce the W's. In Welsh, the W is sometimes pronounced like a what? Sometimes it's pronounced ooh, okay? So, the old man recognizes Gwydion's horse, calls him by name. Terrence says, I know who you are. I've heard about you. Okay? And Terrence says, I'm Terrence of Caradalbin. Gwydion, blah, blah, blah. So he says, I never hope to find you. Medwin, you're, you're right. You couldn't have found me. What, what does he mean? I never could have hoped to find you. Or I never hoped to find you. Find how? It's bottom page 114. If Taryn had been looking for him, if he'd been seeking out Medwin, Medwin says you never would have found him. Okay? Remember what Dalvin said about problems and solutions? He said sometimes the answers you find are not found in the solution to a problem, that is, the conclusion, but in the process. Okay? If Terrence's solution or conclusion had been finding Meadowin, Meadowin says, you never would have found me. But Terrence hasn't been looking for him, and what happens? In the process 
of not looking for him, he finds him. All right? Only the animals know my valley. Melinger led you here. Well, what did Gwydion say to Terran when Terran didn't follow Melinger's lead in crossing the river? He thought he could learn to swim by jumping in the water. He says, this horse has more wisdom than you will ever have, probably. All right? So he looks at him and says, yeah, you're right. You are visitors from Caradalvin. How does he know? Is it like they have an aura, or Terran at least has an aura? And then he sees Henwin. He says, yeah, Hen got here all on her own, etc. Okay? So Meduin leads them on into the valley, leads them to where he lives, essentially. They see a fawn. They see all kinds of animals. What's the valley, essentially? What, what would it be in, in, you know, our world or our mythology, so to speak? It's like Eden. And Meduin would be like, therefore, Adam. He lives in perfect peace and harmony with all the animals. He talk, He's Dr. Doolittle. He talks to them. They talk to him. He remembers when the animals came kind of thing. He's really, really, really old. We don't know about how old. Okay. Terrence says, those are Dalvin's chickens. So, they see bees, etc., etc. Um, skip a bit to page 118. Right. We're told Terran doesn't have any desire to rest. Meduin's Valley had refreshed him more than a night's slumber. He left his bed, rolled, uh, strolled across the meadow. Far side of the lake, he sees otters, etc. They stop. They look at Terran. Water breaks, you know, the surface of the river and such. And we're told, middle of that page. Meadow and Terran saw had gardens of both flowers and vegetables behind the cottage. To his surprise, Terran found himself yearning to work with Call in his own vegetable plot. Does Terran suffer from the problem of the other side of the fence? The phrase that the grass is greener on the other side of the fence? That is, he's never happy where he is. He's always only looking for contentment someplace else and never where he's at. The weeding and hoeing he had so despised at Caradalbin now seemed, as he thought of his past journey from Caradalbin to here and where he was yet to go, now seemed infinitely pleasant. Why? Because he knows exactly what he has to do. He doesn't really have to think about it, right? There's a turnip, there's a weed. Pull the weed. It's pretty simple. So, page 119, he and Meduin start talking. And Meduin says, they're talking about Gurgi. Terran says, you know, I've, I've thought of Gurgi. At first I wasn't, I didn't like him. Now I've kind of begun to like him. In spite of all of his whining and complaining. Maybe that's why he kind of likes him. Maybe Gurgi is a little bit like Terran. Okay? And Meduin says, every living creature, every living thing deserves our respect. Be it humble or proud, ugly or beautiful. Now, which is Gurgi on those two spectrums? Humble or proud, ugly or beautiful. Humble and ugly. Gurgi doesn't walk around or scamper around thinking, you know, he's king of the beasts. He also doesn't walk around thinking he's the most uh, beautiful thing that's ever lived. Taryn, I wouldn't want to say that about the Gwythaints. Remember what the Gwythaints are? The birds with the claws that eat flesh? Terrence says, those things don't deserve our respect. So if they don't deserve respect, if they don't deserve 
to live, what do they deserve? Hatred and death. Medwin, I feel only sorrow for those unhappy creatures, and he tells us why. Once long ago, they were as free as other birds, gentle and trusting. In his cunning, Aran lured them to him and brought them under his power. He built the iron cages, which are now their prison house in Anubin. The tortures he inflicted on the Grithanes were shameful and unspeakable. Now they serve him out of terror. If you've read Lord of the Rings, what Aran did to the Grithanes is the same thing as what a character before the Lord of the Rings named Morgoth or Melkor. It's the same thing he did to elves. He captured elves and he twisted them, he tormented them, he tortured them, he bred and inbred and inbred and inbred them, and he turned elves, anybody know? Into the orcs. And when you get to the Lord of the Rings, the orcs are the only creatures in all of Middle-earth that cannot be redeemed at all. They have nothing, zero goodness in them. At all. Okay? They're just there to be slaughtered, essentially. Meduin says, not the good things. They only serve Iran. Why? Out of terror. Out of fear. Remove the source of the fear, and Manuin implies what will happen to the Grithanes. Not immediately, but what? Over time. What can happen? That terror and fear can be bred out of them. So, he goes on and says, that's what he's done to the Grithanes. Guess what? That's what he wants to do to every animal in Prydain no less than the race of men. Why? He wants to corrupt it. Not destroy it. He wants to change each animal, each creature, from its original purpose, whatever that purpose was. That is one of the reasons I remain in the valley here. Here, Iran cannot harm them. Even so, were he to become ruler of this land, I doubt I could help them all. In other words, while I stay here, Iran can't touch them. But if he rules over all of Prydain, I can't help them all. I can help a few of them. This will be in, like an Eden. Okay. Those who fall into his clutches would be counted fortunate. Terran, now I understand more and more why I have to warn the sons of dawn. Why I have to go to the king. Okay. Maybe Gurgi would be safer here. Notice what Terran is doing there. Maybe I should leave Gurgi here. Taking what from Gurgi? Choice. Choice. Gurgi has chosen what? To follow and serve Terran. Medwin. Sure he would. But you'd hurt him grievously. Gurgi's misfortune is that he is neither one thing nor the other at the moment. He's neither what? He has lost the wisdom of animals and has not gained the learning of men. Therefore, both shun him. He's persona non grata in the animal kingdom in the human kingdom. Nobody wants anything to do with him. If you were to tell him to stay here, he says, that would be horrible for Gurgi. Why? Because Gurgi wants to align himself with Terran and humanity. Notice, he's lost the wisdom of the animals and has not gained the learning of men. By wisdom, he means the natural intuition of animals. He's lost that. But he hasn't replaced it with the gained, the quote-unquote book learning, so to speak, of men. Gurgi is what? He's kind of a human in becoming. Think of him as a midway on the evolutionary scale, if you want. He's not quite fully human, but he's no longer fully animal. Neither refuse to give help, Meadowin goes on, when it is needed, 
nor refuse to accept it when it is offered. So, don't give help when it's needed, and don't refuse it when it's offered. Well, Gurgi's offered help. He's also saying this because he's going to be offered help later on from somebody else, or something else, I should say. All right? So, next page, 121. Medouin, they're still talking. And Medouin says, I have, stuff, I have studied the race of men. I have seen that alone, that is, as an individual, you, men, a single man, stand as weak reeds by a lake. You must learn to help yourselves, that is true, but you must also learn to help one another. Are you not all of you lame ants? And he's told the story previously, just previously, of a lame ant. Okay, And what's the purpose of the story? An individual, by him or herself, is how strong? But a whole bunch of individuals banded together can do what? Topple kingdoms. You need an example? Look at the history of the 20th century. The totalitarian governments. For all of those totalitarian governments, what toppled them? What toppled, for example, the Soviet Union? What caused the Soviet Union to fall apart? It wasn't just Gorbachev and his glasnost and perestroika. Okay? It wasn't one person going to the Berlin Wall in November of 1988 and starting to chip away at it. It was one person, and then another, and then another, and then scores, and then hundreds. Well, what did the East German soldiers realize at that point? They couldn't kill them all. Why? They just keep coming. They would just keep coming. What has brought, recently, France to its knees, if you're familiar with the news? The quote-unquote orange vest or yellow vest protesters. Who are the yellow vest protesters? They are middle class people who are fed up with high taxes and the government telling them this is what you must do and you have no say in the matter. They're like, really? You, you want to challenge us on that? We'll shut down Paris. And that's exactly what they've done. Okay. Individually, you stand up against the full weight of a government, and what happens? Well, if it's a former Soviet Union, you disappear. <laughs> if it's the United States, you can get thrown in jail. Okay? But when a whole bunch of people do it, then something has to change. All right? So Taryn finally says, what, what, where am I? <laughs> what place is this, really? Are you indeed Medouin? You speak of the race of men as if you were not one of them. Well, it's a it's a place of peace, man. It's, like, it's just smoke or pot and, you know, get one with nature. And therefore, not suitable for men, at least not yet. Why not yet? Corruption of man. He spoke about Gurgi and said, Gurgi has lost the wisdom of animals and hasn't yet replaced it with the learning of men. Well, what do men need to do? Maybe learn some of that wisdom of animals? How many of you, for example, can tell what time of day it is merely by looking outside? By the sun. That's part of what he means. See, our lives are so mediated by artificial environments. Artificial lights, artificial air, heated and cooled, etc., etc. He's kind of saying man has lost connection with nature. Until it is, that is, until this is a suitable place for men. And it's not that, oh, I've got to build more buildings for the men to stay in. 
It's the men need to become suitable for it. Until it is, I hold this valley for creatures of the forest and the waters. And I think what he's kind of getting at there, to get at something Shelby pointed out earlier, this is kind of an Eden. Because in the whole Christian tradition, the whole Christian story, what is Eden really? It's the place everybody's trying to get back to. It's paradise. It's perfection. Heaven of sorts. In their mortal danger, they, the animals, come to me. And if they, if they have the strength to. Okay. Terrence said, Dobbin taught me that when the black waters flooded Pradane ages ago, Nev and Nav, Nev, whatever, built a ship and carried with them two of every living creature. Oh, gee, what does that sound like? Uh, Noah. I gotta ask you, are you, I am Medwin, for all that my name may concern you. That is, you can call me Medwin, but he's kind of implying, yeah, I might be that other guy too, okay? So, Taryn asks, do you think Gwydion's been killed? He goes, don't know. Chapter 14. They're getting ready to leave. They haven't left yet. But they're getting ready to leave. And Taryn is still talking with Meadowin. Or not still. The night has come. Taryn can't sleep. And bottom of 124, Meadowin, in fact, says, not asleep? Restless night is not a good way to begin a journey. Taryn, it's a journey I'm eager to end. There are times when I fear I shall not see Kara Dalbin again. And yet, the very morning that he ran off after Hinwin, what did he want? To leave. Now, he just wants to go home. Da uh, Meadowin. It is not given to men to know the ends of their journeys. Okay. What did Terrence say? It's a journey I am eager to end. What journey? Go to Cairdethel, warn them, and then go back home. Why? He knows where Enwin is. He doesn't have to find Enwin now. So again, he's looking at what? He's looking at the end of the journey and not the steps that it takes to achieve that end. And that's why Meadowin says, it's not given to men to know the ends of their journeys. Why not? What would happen if somebody came up to you today and said, Michael, on such and such a date, at such and such a time of the day, you're going to get hit, hit by a car and killed. And guess what? I'm always right. I've never been wrong. You can bank on it. What does that make you do? Might make you, you know, think about, okay, so how, what do I want to do with the remaining time I have? Does it make you then change your behavior? Medwin is saying, we don't know where that end is. Why? Because that end isn't yet. Where does that end come from? One step, followed by another step, followed by another step. Bilbo Baggins says in The Hobbit, sings a song that says, the road goes ever on. You don't know where it ends. Why? Because it doesn't end until you take your last breath. Period. It may be you will never return to the places dearest to you. Well, what are the places, obviously, dearest to Taryn? Care Dalbin. Does he mean, Terry, you might never get home? You might die on this journey? Possibly. What else can that mean, though? Terry can't go back to the terror, the care Dalbin that he left. Why not? The journey changed him. He is already not the Terran of Kara Dalbin that he was when he left a few days ago. He's already what? Grown. He's experienced things. His eyes have been opened. Okay. 
so that even when he goes back to Cairdalvin, how he will see everything will be a little bit different, at least a little bit different. Medwin goes on, but how can that matter if what you must do is here and now? That is, what does it matter whether you get back there? When what's important is what? The very thing in front of your face. That is, the very next thing you must do. Why is it important if you start talking with your advisor, let's say, and you're planning out your degree plan, and you're, you know, a sophomore and you're thinking of your senior year? Well, you got to kind of have a general outline. But what's really important in order to achieve that ultimate degree plan? Well, this class, and this class, and this class, and this class. What if your ultimate goal is to be a millionaire? What, if the, what does that mean? You start putting away money, this paycheck, this paycheck, and this paycheck, etc. It, it doesn't, you know, you wake up when you're 55 and go, oh, I'm going to be a millionaire tomorrow. Not unless you win the lottery. Not many chances of that. Taryn, I think that if I knew I were not to see my own home again, I would be happy to stay in this valley. Why? Well, one, the valley's like paradise, right? Why else? If I weren't able to go back home, what's he really saying? That I would just stop right here. Why? I'm happy. Doesn't he still have a job to do? Doesn't care Daffle still need to be warned? Medwin. Your heart is young and unformed. Why unformed? He doesn't mean literally your heart's amorphous. What does he mean by heart? Courage. It hasn't been tested. Kind of like those swords he was trying to make. Yet if I read it well, you are of the few I would welcome here. That is, you know... I, I would actually say you could stay here. Surely you can entrust your task to your friends. Now what is Medwin offering him? Escape from the journey? Escape from the responsibility? Isn't this really a temptation? Isn't this, oh man, look at that fruit. Oh, that looks good. You could be like God. Satan says to Eve, all you got to do is take a bite. Okay? In the early Christian tradition, when it's said in Genesis that Adam and Eve were made in the image and likeness of God, these aren't synonyms. The early commentators, the early Theologians of the church said, these are two totally different things. This is, you know, free will, choice, etc. This is as a result of acting on this. That is, humanity was designed to become this. How? There's that fruit. Simple act of obedience. Simple living out of virtue. Okay? So what happens? You can stay if you want. He's got the image part, so now what does Taryn have to do? Do I take a bite? Or do I do the hard work necessary? Okay? You can... You you can let your friends do that. Well, what does that mean, giving over to his friends? Because how easy is the, the task going to be? It's like a death sentence. Is that really what you want to give your friends? No, no, no. I, I, I'd really like you to do this instead. Taryn, no, I've, I've taken it on myself through my own choice. Well, then you could give it up, right? Through your own choice. I mean, 
Who'd you swear an oath to? Tara, no, can't do that. And notice when he says no, he's looking across the whole valley. It's like he sees, proverbially, heaven spread out before him. He says, no, I made that decision when? Before I came here. Medwin, then so be it. I grant you all that you will allow me to grant. A night's rest. Sleep well. And it's like, you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi did the hand thing and psh, Taryn is sound asleep. Okay? So, the next morning they go on. And bottom of 129, Taryn and Fluter are talking as they make their way. And Fluter says, a person can have enough wandering, you know. That is, a, a person can get tired of wandering and just decide they want to settle down. It made me think I might even settle down again and try to be a respectable sort of a king. Taryn, Kerr Dalbin is closer to my heart. When I left, I never gave it too much thought. Now, I think of it a great deal. Again, why? Rasmus Greener syndrome? I don't think so. You know, we have a phrase, absence makes what? The heart grow fonder. It's not Dalbin's absence or Call's absence from absence from Taryn. It's Taryn's absence from there. It's why people get quote unquote homesick. Okay. So they keep going on. And, you know, he and all I'm, we have a little spat, page 131. I want to skip that. Uh, they go on, they get captured by the dwarves, not dwarves, sorry, the little people, let's call them, uh, King Eideleg, and bottom of 141, Eideleg of the little people tells Terran when Terran and Fluter try to explain what is going on in the world up above? Eidelig says, This is a conflict you great gawks must attend to yourselves. Great gawks, you large oafs, you bumbling morons. Okay? The fair folk owe you no allegiance. That is, we don't swear loyalty to you. And we don't owe you anything. Pridane belonged to us before the race of men came. You drove us underground. That is part of Welsh and Celtic mythology. That, you know, Britain used to be populated by what are called the fair folk, the fair people, okay? Leprechauns, if you want. And humans came and drove them underground into caverns and caves and things like that, okay? You plundered our mines, you blundering clodpoles, you stole our treasures. Terry, you know, I'm sorry about all, all that. I can speak for no man for, but myself. That is, what's Terran really saying? This is a real modern relevance. I didn't. I didn't plunder your mines. I didn't drive you underground. He's saying, I'm a 12-year-old kid. You can't lay all that crap on me. That's not my fault. All right? You could do that applying it to today, I think, on your own. Terrence says, I've never robbed you. I don't have wished you. My task means more to me than your... I don't want your gold. If there's ill will between the fair folk and the race of men, then it's a matter to be settled between them. He goes, all I want is to be able to go to Cardathel and warn about the Horn King. If the Horn King triumphs, the shadow of Anuvan falls on the land above you, and guess what? It'll make its way down into your land. So how does he appeal to Idolic? Does he, does he appeal to his sense of nobility? To his sense of morality? No. You better let me go, or ultimately you're going to be the one to pay. You think things are bad now because of how the big people have treated you? Just wait till Iran 
gets down here. Okay? So he appeals to his sense of self-preservation. Idolic. You know, that's pretty good, kid. For an assistant pig keeper, you're reasonably eloquent. But we'll worry about Iran when the time comes. Yeah, well, what's happened throughout history to every people who have, have essentially made that argument? We'll worry about Hitler when we need to. We'll worry about, you know, uh, the emperor, Tojo, when we need to. We'll worry, well, what happens? You wake up, you need to, and it's too late. Okay, Taryn, that time's already here. I just hope we're not too late. Okay, so, Alanwi says, I don't think you really know what's going on above ground. You talk about charm and beauty, blah, blah, blah. You don't really care. You're conceited. You're stubborn, selfish, etc. So, Idla gives in, and he sends kind of a, not a warrior, an aide with them named Dolly. All right? Page 145, Taryn appeals, uh, appeals to Eidelig's sense of honor, and he says, yeah, I was afraid you'd come to that. True, the fair folk never break their word. Well, okay. You get your pig back. Taryn, uh, we need weapons also. <sighs> okay, you can have your weapons. And maybe a guide. So, he gives them Dolly. Now, what's the thing about Dolly? What's Dolly's problem? Can't turn invisible. He can't make himself invisible. These are the little people, the, the fairy folk. They're supposed to, you know, be able to turn invisible. And he can't. He sits here until he's blue in the face, and he doesn't turn invisible. Okay? And what else about Dolly? He never thinks anything's going to work. He's the, you know, sourpuss among the group, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, let's go on. Chapter 17, The Fledgling. Okay? They find a Gwithaint stuck in a bush. One wing upraised, the other folded awkwardly. They follow Terran. Terran goes up closely to it. It kind of wants to try to bite him. And Fluter says, it's a good thing the parents aren't about or we'd be dead. Dolly pulls his axe. He's getting ready to kill it. Terran, no, you can't. The dwarf says, I'm going to kill it, you know. If it gets loose, it's going to tell all of its companions. Terran, I would not have it killed. Top of 155. It's in pain and it needs help. I love it. It's true. It doesn't look comfortable. All right. Dolly, yeah, but we could kill it and eat it. I mean, we're hungry. Fluter, yeah, that's true. Bottom of 155. Medwin would not say so, Taryn answered. In the hills he spoke of kindness for all creatures. And he told me much about the Gwithaints. I think it's important to bring this one to Cair Dathel. No one has ever captured a live Gwithaint, as far as I know. Who can tell what value it may, it may have? Now, what's Terran thinking? Who can tell what value it may have? He's not talking about value like, I can sell the Gwithaint. What kind of value is he talking about? Could it help them? Could it aid them? Could it communicate somehow and reveal plans like a spy? Okay. The bird, well, you know, okay. So... They build it a cage, they cage it, they feed it, they give it water, they care for it. Page 157. Terrence starts trying to build a cage, and Dolly's like, oh, stop. And Dolly builds the cage himself. Okay. They care for it. Bottom of 159. Next morning, the cage is empty. That is, the Gwithaint has healed, more or less, and it's escaped. 
And Dolly goes, there you go, told you, warned you. Now that treacherous creature is off to warn others. Taryn could not hide his disappointment or fear. I've done the wrong thing again, as usual. It's like everything I do is wrong. Dolly is right. There's no difference between a fool and an assistant pig keeper. Alanwi, well, you know, it's probably true, but I don't like people who say, I told you so. Dolly, she says, even so, Dolly means well. He's not half as disagreeable as he pretends to be. Okay. What's she getting at? She's getting at Dolly has this gruff exterior on the outside, but I really think he's a softy on the inside. And when he said, keep me away from his exact phrase, spare me from fools and assistant pig keepers, she is trying to tell Taryn he didn't really mean it. He's just upset. Okay? So, they go on. Chapter 18, the Flame of Durinan. Uh, Durinwin, sorry. Let's see here. They see the Horn King Scouts. We're going to skip a bunch again. Go on through... Um, go on to, what is that, chapter 18, I think. It's the chapter 19, The Secret. Like I said, we're skipping a lot. They discover Gwydion and Taryn, page 176. They've made it to Cairdathel, um, discover Gwydion, Taryn drops down on his knee. The top of 176, the authority of the warrior's bearing made Taryn drop to one knee, Lord Gwydion. And Gwydion says, that is no greeting from a friend to a friend. In other words, stop the Lord stuff. Why? We were soldiers together, you know. It gives me more pleasure to remember an assistant pig keeper who feared I had poisoned him in the forest near Caradalbin, etc., etc. So they talk a little bit, and they talk about uh, Idaleg, they talk about what happened to Gwydion and such, and page 178 towards the bottom. Gwydion is talking about what happened between himself and Akron. He says, what she did to him. The worst were not of the body, that is the torments. The worst were not of the body, but of the spirit. And of these, the most painful was despair. Yet even in my deepest anguish, I clung to hope. For there is this about eth and eth. If a man withstand it, even death will give up its secrets to him. Okay. Eth and eth is the name of the spiral castle and such. So he says, I withstood it. And at the end, much was revealed to me, which before had been clouded. I'm not going to tell you what, but here's what you need to know. It is enough for you to know that I understood the workings of life and death, of tears, of laughter and tears, endings and beginnings. I saw the truth of the world and knew no chains could hold me. My bonds were light as dreams. At that moment, the walls of my prison melted. Why? What were the walls of his prison? They weren't literal walls. What had she done? He essentially put a spell on him that made him think what were walls were walls. How so? How can our thoughts imprison us? Take two children, three years old. Okay? Put one in the set of parents put the other with another set of parents. Have this set of parents tell that child from three years old to 18, you are a lousy, worthless piece of, you will never amount to anything, you sorry piece of, every day that child is told that until the age of 18. Have the other one say, 
you are inherently worthy, I love you, and you can do whatever you dream to do. What's going to be the difference between those two children? This one is bound in a cage of what? Thoughts. Beliefs. Because the child has been told, you will never be anything. Okay? They talk about Gwithaints and such. Um... Let's see. Gwydion talks about learning the Horn King's name from Henwyn. And... Yeah, we'll pick up with... Page 179 on Friday. So, uh, we'll finish this pretty quickly and get into the Black Cauldron. Um... I would say try to have, I think I've got three days assigned for the Black Cauldron, about a third of the Black Cauldron read. That's about how much I'm going to try to get through. You know, we'll try to stick with the uh, syllabus from here on out. All right, have a good day.